Uh, I was asked to uh, talk about damage to the seeing brain glaucoma. Let's just start off with, does anybody know who this is? So this is a patient that was seen in 1906 by a German uh, psychiatrist. And she came to him with hallucinations and with uh, confusion, agitation, memory loss. This was actually uh, the first patient diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and this is her, she died, and uh, Dr. Alzheimer looked at her brain under the microscope, and this is the classic amyloid uh, plaque. So why am I talking about that? Well, it's a very common disease. It's a big concern uh, in every country around the world. India is no exception. It is a disease that affects older uh, people, and there is, uh, it's a cognitive disorder. There's a loss of a specific group of neurons, memory neurons, and uh, it's characterized by uh, some pathology. And when we think about neurodegenerative disease hallmarks, it could be a question, it could be progressive, uh, loss of specific neuro, uh, neuron populations, transsynaptic degeneration, and accumulation of abnormal proteins. So here we have, well, what about glaucoma? What does that have to do it with? I'm going to share with you a series of experiments uh, that we did. And so it is a little bit of science, uh, but I think it'll bring us back to the clinic. And so uh, way back, we took normal monkeys, raised pressure in one eye, top bar, and uh, then uh, used the fellow eyes of control, and then we looked at the optic nerve. And these are the optic nerves. So the big fat nerve has myelinated, about a million myelinated fibers, and there's various degrees of glaucoma. So this is looking at the optic nerve right behind the globe. And this is uh, what it looks like under the microscope at that level. So if you cut right behind the globe, there's an EM. You know, can you tell if they're magno, parvo, or conio? Of course not. So the beauty is that we know that retinal ganglion cells are only partially, only the cell bodies in the eye, and that the long axon actually projects all the way to the brain in the lateral geniculate nucleus, and it's there that we can get our information about these various neurons and what's happening. So the magnocellular layers, as we remember, are in the uh, ventral. The parvocellular re responsible for red green are in the dorsal. And then we have our blue-yellow uh, neurons sandwiched in between the major six layers. If a monkey with glaucoma, if you look at the lateral geniculate nucleus, has a shrunken lateral geniculate nucleus. You could see it on your uh, right. And when we look at this under very high power, uh, compared to the normal uh, uh, brain, you can see that the neurons are sparse and smaller. Now, it's not enough in science to just sort of say, hmm, I think it looks different. You actually have to measure it, and so we did. And um, measuring it, uh, what we found was that there was significant loss of the neurons, and uh, this was published. And so we know that neurons die. A lot of them die if you raise pressure in the eye, in the brain. Well, what about the cells that are left behind? If you measure them, they actually shrink, and there's a shift to the left. And I remember, want you to remember this slide because um, I'll refer to it later on. The lateral geniculate nucleus neurons shrink in glaucoma, and if you look at the pathway of the conio cell, the blue-yellow, uh, they also are reduced. And so three major vision pathways are affected in glaucoma, and we know that the lateral geniculate nucleus neurons go on to project to the cortex. And in monkey, when we looked at the cortex, we used cytochrome oxidase C, which is a metabolic marker. The top is normal. It's got a homogeneous dark brown stain. But at the bottom, you see these alternating bands of uh, light and dark that refer to the ocular dominance columns. And the lighter bands are uh, referred to the uh, uh, glaucoma eye compared to the fellow, so it's affected. And so, at least in the monkey, the neurons in the, in the brain are shrinking, there's loss, there's evidence that three pathways are affected, and there's evidence that things are moving all the way to the back of the brain. So you don't think about it, but when you raise pressure in the eye of a monkey, 
there's a lot of stuff that's going on throughout the visual system. And of course, the question that we were very interested in is, are, does it matter in humans? And so I want to share with you a case. So this is a 79-year-old gentleman who presented to me. He, had, he presented with large cups. He was on a single drop. And these were his fields and uh, superior hemifield loss. He died 18 months later, and he had consented for organ donation for research. And so I'm going to share with you um, uh, some uh, findings uh, in his uh, central visual system. I'm going to show you uh, what he looked like just prior before the chiasm, what he looked like at the lateral geniculate nucleus, and in, at the visual cortex level. So this is a, this is intracranial optic nerve in the center and compared to four age match controls. And you can see with the neurofilament stain, it's very shrunken compared to the others. This is the glaucoma lateral geniculus through the largest uh, cross-sectional area, and it was smaller compared to all of the controls. And here is the volume. And uh, under the high power microscope, we saw things very similar to what we saw in the monkey primate glaucoma. And when we looked at the visual cortex, this was the mantle. And so we were able in this single case to actually show changes throughout the visual system compared to uh, age match controls. And so with confidence, I think uh, we felt that this, you know, human glaucoma is associated with degenerative changes in major vision centers of the brain. And so this was published. And uh, we were very interested to say, well, okay, so he, this was post-mortem, what about patients coming through the clinic? So we said, well, we really need to figure out a way to look at uh, the lateral geniculate nucleus in these patients, and it's really proof of concept. So we, uh, uh, in Alzheimer's disease, they measure vertical height. So we said, well, why don't we do that for the lateral geniculate nucleus? And so we got a few radiologists, blinded them to the diagnosis, um, figured out a protocol to visualize the lateral geniculate nucleus in every patient, and then got them to measure the heights. And what we found was that in glaucoma it was uh, uh, smaller. And so uh, this was published, uh, and, and, now, and we know that we can expect to see atrophy of the lateral geniculate nucleus in glaucoma. Now, this doesn't mean that we are going to be rushing out to image our glaucoma patients. I think this is just power to the course that, you know, this disease, if you work with monkeys and you, you can induce all kinds of changes, but in glaucoma, in human glaucoma, there are also detectable changes. And so since that work, there has been an explosion of interest in seeing the brain in glaucoma. So microstructure, at, so at that time, you know, there were maybe a blip on Google if you look at citations. Now there's microstructure, perfusion, activity, structures, connectivity, metabolism. Here's an example of some molecular imaging with positron emission for tomography. This one is using tensor, diffusion tensor imaging. These papers are coming out around the world. This one is looking at um, behind uh, the eye, looking at um, uh, differences in uh, the diffusion tensor magnitude. This one is looking at 3T Tesla. So the study that I showed you was the poor man's uh, MRI, 1.5 Tesla available in any hospital. That was the challenge. How do you visualize the lateral geniculate nucleus? Now you can do it with 3 Tesla. All of the studies are confirming it. The new magnetic resonance imaging techniques are finding cortical changes in our patients. So this is really very relevant. Um, and to, so we know that there are changes at the lateral geniculate nucleus, the structural MRI. There's a lot of evidence for white matter tract optic radiations, I'm sure, uh, and, and, there's a in, and there's also evidence at the level of the cortex and beyond. And so, of course, if you got all this damage to these centers in glaucoma, you basically have contacts in the pathway that are destroyed, right? So there's nothing to pass the baton onto, or the you know the the the, the guy at the other end is not is not uh, ready, and so the signal processes are disturbed, and it's no wonder we don't see very well in glaucoma. And I've shown you the retinogeniculocortical pathway, but I think it's important to remember, you know, from the previous talk with Dr. Lee, 
talked about driving and movement and stairs and some of the work that Pradeep has done with reading. There's a superior colliculus that we mustn't forget about. And that uh, pathway is responsible for eye movements. And so we were really interested. We thought, well, geez, you know, is the superior colliculus uh, involved? So we uh, had a, a student come and, and uh, he went off to the UK where we purchased this machine, trained uh, by the inventor, uh, came back and we got him to do a group of patients. And what we found was that there were delayed psychotic eye movements in glaucoma. And we worked with Marty Steinbeck, who um, is a guru in eye movements. And so we were very excited to see actually that, you know, these are uh, rapid eye movements that keep us alive, you know, to make sure we don't fall down the stairs. When we go shopping, you can quickly scan the environment and so um, the driving. So could it be that this is a, is a reason for the falls partially? Could it be this is a reason for some of the driving accidents that we see? Um, is, is that a reason why you don't have a lot of disability that's necessarily correlated beautifully with the disease advancement? You can get, even in early disease, you can get significant disability and patients can complain. And so glaucoma disease shows extensive involvement of brain pathways. And how do you know what the mechanisms are? Well, there's evidence of stress in the brain, glutamate excitotoxicity, you might have learned microglial activation, reactive glial. So these are all potential mechanisms. And I'll just, because it's relevant, and we have two minutes, two and a half minutes left, I won't keep you beyond the time. Memantine was FDA approved for Alzheimer's. There was a massive clinical trial, some of you may remember, that looked at memantine pills to treat glaucoma to see if it was neuroprotective. It was big rage. We were really excited. We, there were big hopes um, for disclosure. I was a, an investigator in that trial. The endpoint wasn't met, so they did white on white perimetry, and the visual field uh, progression was what we were looking for to see if it was neuroprotective. It didn't work. Um, we did a, another study where we looked just at the dendrites, and uh, um, you know, that's that story. So. Alzheimer's disease, they've got biochemical markers. What about glaucoma? You know, we've got pressure, nerve, and feels. Do we have m markers? We've got all this great genetics uh, clues that are coming out. What are our molecules? Can we do a blood test? We don't have any right now, but if we were to design one, knowing that we've got this visual system degeneration, knowing that central vision neurons that degenerate must secrete or break down into the extracellular space that ends up in the blood, knowing that, um, you know, there's other uh, pathways that we could get to them, uh, you know, would we, would, we look, would we look for them in the aqueous? Would we look for them in the lymph? Would we poke the vitreous to look for them? Would we look at the cerebrospinal fluid? So just on that... Does that mean I have 30 seconds? Oh, I have another minute? Okay. So, so, you know, there's a lot of interest in CSF and glaucoma. And so I'm really very excited to uh, share with you some data. You notice how in this slide, the CSF is pointing to the space around the nerve. So we have just described, and then there's potentially the blood. We've just uh, described the evidence for cerebrospinal fluid uh, entry into the optic nerve via G lymphatic pathway. And we think that uh, this uh, has some real implications for our understanding of uh, glaucoma. And uh, we're really excited about this. We're now looking at glaucoma models to see uh, if it changes. But I think we're on the tip of some really exciting stuff. Uh, let's exploit the brain in glaucoma. It's a biomarker. It's a tool that we could track the disease, explore new measurable endpoints. And vision restoration is around the corner if we dream about it. And um, it's affected early. It's promising as a tool. There are opportunities for medicines. If we could give something to people to make their brains more robust, we have a fighting chance at this disease to help reduce that uh, rate of decay. And uh, this is just some fancy stuff that's going on. And take-home messages, real simple. These are our biomarkers 
for a disease that we call glaucoma that we are still struggling to understand. The next time that you look at an optic nerve in the clinic, if you can just remember that this is just the tip of the iceberg of what we're looking at. Thank you so much for your attention. It's been a real honor to be here, and I want to thank Venkatesh and the team and the Aravind leadership for everything. Thank you so much. I can't think of a better way to spend a birthday. Thank you. <laughs>